All right, let's turn our Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter number 5. One of the big things that we emphasize about soul winning at our church and a lot of these other churches, and really I think any soul winning presentation that's thorough and complete should emphasize this, and that is the fact of eternal life, everlasting life, the eternal security of the believer. And what we mean by that is the fact that you can't lose your salvation. We call this also once saved, always saved. Now, I go to a lot of soul winning events all over the country and talk to a lot of different people who listen to my sermons online. And one of my favorite questions to ask them is, how did you first hear about us? You know, which video was it on YouTube that you first clicked on or whatever? And whenever I get these testimonies from different people, when people tell me that they got saved listening to my preaching, the vast majority of the time, it's a specific sermon that they reference. They tell me, I got saved listening to the sermon, once saved, always saved. Now, who is here tonight that that sermon, you got saved as a result of that sermon? Now, look around. That's just one sermon. And a lot of people are saying, hey, that's how I got saved was hearing that sermon. Now, what that tells me and what that should tell you is that a lot of people's hang up that's keeping them from being saved is that they think you could lose your salvation. And hearing that sermon, once saved, always saved, cleared that up for them, and that's when they receive Christ as Savior. That's when they put all of their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and got saved. And the reason for that is that our biggest enemy when we're out soul winning is work salvation, right? We're not predominantly dealing with Hindus and Buddhists and, and people out in the jungle. I mean, we're living in the United States here, and our biggest enemy out soul winning is the doctrine of works-based salvation. And this works-based salvation takes many forms. But if you really can teach people the concept of eternal security, it just completely removes any doubt from their mind. And it completely removes any reliance on works. Because if you fully understand eternal security, you're fully trusting Christ as Savior. I mean, think about it, because if you get down to the core of it, if you're saying that you can lose your salvation, what you're basically saying is that you have to do something to stay saved. You have to, you have to maintain some level of morality, or you have to do good works, or not do bad things. And so the very idea of losing your salvation is works-based salvation. Because they'll say, well, you know, you don't have to do any works to get saved, but you'll lose it if you don't do the work. Well, guess what? That's where you're still working to get to heaven at that point. Or, well, you know, if you do something bad, God's going to take it away from you. Well, then basically what they're saying is that you have to keep the commandments in order to stay saved. And keeping the commandments is called in Galatians the works of the law. And we're not justified by the works of the law or following the law. We are justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Now look down at your Bible there in 1 John chapter 5, verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And what the Bible is telling us in this verse is that there are two kinds of people. There are the ones who believe God, and there are the ones who've made God a liar. Because anytime you don't believe someone, you're basically saying that they're lying. And he says, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. So there are two kinds of people, those who believe on Christ that are saved, and then there are those who make God a liar because they don't believe the record that God gave of his son. And what is the record? The record is that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. It doesn't say he gave us conditional life or he gave us temporary life. No, he gave us eternal life. And if you don't believe that God has past tense given us eternal life and that that life is in his son, what are you doing? You're making God a liar. You're not the one who believes God. You're not the one who has the witness in himself, the witness being the Holy Spirit. You don't have the Holy Spirit inside you. You don't have the witness. You don't believe God. Why? Because you don't believe the record that he gave of his son, that God has given to us eternal life. 
You see, the most important components of salvation are in this verse that God has given to us. He didn't sell us eternal life. He didn't bargain with us or contract us to do work for him so that we could earn eternal life. He gave us eternal life. It's the gift of God. And he gave us eternal life, meaning that it doesn't end. And this life is in his son. It's got to be through Jesus. There's no other way to be saved. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the son of God. And so, therefore, I strongly believe that anyone who does not believe in eternal security is not saved. Amen. And this is, in fact, one of the best ways to tell if someone's saved or not. By asking that question, as I covered yesterday, if we can lose our salvation. Because then, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak, and that person will usually start to tell you, well, you can't just live however you want. I mean, you mean to tell me you could go out and commit all these... Listen, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. The more we sin, the more God's grace steps in and covers our sin. Now, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We should not sin. But if we do, we're covered. You know, the Bible says, My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. But if any man sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So eternal security is key. But what I want to talk about today, I don't want to get up here and preach a sermon about eternal security because that's what Pastor Roger Jimenez is going to do a little bit later on. I don't want to steal his thunder. But what I do want to do is talk about how to teach eternal security at the door. How to explain eternal security as part of your gospel presentation. Now, amongst the old IFB, typically the way they would do this is they would go through the basic plan of salvation without covering eternal security. Then they would lead that person in prayer, and then they would call this part giving them assurance. So they'd pray with the person, and then after they pray with them, then they would go into eternal security as what they called giving the person assurance. Now, here's the problem with that, is that a lot of people that were praying there haven't yet fully understood that salvation is by faith, and they still think it's partially by works. Because I would say when I go out soul winning and I go through the plan of salvation, usually it's not until I explain eternal security that it finally clicks with the person that it's all faith, and now it works. Now, look, there are some people who, when you just explain to them that it's all faith, they get it. Yeah. And when you get to the eternal security part, they didn't even need it because they already got that. They already understood that. In my opinion, and this isn't an exact science, in my opinion, about nine out of ten people need eternal security explained to them Amen. before it clicks with them because they've been so bombarded with work salvation and losing your salvation. Now, one out of ten people, when you get to eternal security, they've already, they already understood it up to that point. And they already get that it's all by faith. But that's why I think that a lot of the people that get saved through some of this old IFB-style soul winning, a lot of them aren't really getting saved because of the fact that they don't quite get it. Now, hopefully after that assurance part is explained, if they do a thorough job or a good job with that, then the person would actually understand it, and then the person could actually get saved. That's why a lot of times you'll see people... They'll uh, think that they got saved, and then about a week or two later, then they'll actually get saved. And it takes a couple weeks for it all to sink in. Part of that's because it might not have all been explained to them thoroughly up front. So when we go soul winning, we want to explain all of it thoroughly the first time, right? Because it's best if we can get it right the first time. So let's move eternal security from after the prayer to before the prayer so we can make sure they actually know what they're praying and what they're even receiving. So how do we explain this when we're out soul winning? Now, there are a lot of different verses that you can turn to and a lot of illustrations that you can use. But the main thing to keep in mind is that your goal is to get people to understand this concept, number one, and getting them to believe this concept, number two. Now, the biggest mistake that I see in this area 
is where people use crazy illustrations and really wild ways of explaining this to where it even sounds unbelievable to me and I believe in it. <laughs> and even I'm kind of raising an eyebrow at some of these illustrations. And I've believed in eternal security since I was a little kid, but even I'm a little bit taken aback by some of these radical illustrations. Look, our goal is to get people to understand it and to believe it. So don't make it sound crazy. Make it sound like something that makes sense and is believable because that's exactly what it is. It does make sense and it is believable. And let me explain to you how that is. Now, the most classic illustration that we use when we're out soul winning is that of a gift. When we talk about eternal security. So we use Romans 6.23 and say, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we explain that a gift is not something that you pay for, but it's something that you receive for free. And that once that gift is given to you, it belongs to you now. And if someone gives you a gift, they don't have the right to come back later and say, hey, I need that back. We'd say that it wasn't a gift then. Now, especially if that gift is called eternal life, eternal means it never ends. So if God gives you a gift that lasts forever, how many times do you have to get it? Only one time. And once you have it, it's yours to keep. It's yours forever. That's a pretty classic illustration. It's a basic illustration, but it's one that works. People understand it, that when you give them a gift, it belongs to them. It was paid for by the giver. Christ paid for our salvation. We receive it for free, and it's eternal. What's he, and I always ask the people, what does eternal mean? Forever, exactly. So if God gives you a gift that lasts forever, how many times do you have to get it? Just once. Is he going to come back and take it away from you? No. Another illustration that is a really good one, is that of a father and a son. The Bible says in John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So if we believe on the name of Jesus, we become the sons of God. And I always ask people if they have children, and then I use their child as an example, or I'll often have one of my children with me, and I'll use my child for an example, and I'll say, you know, this is my daughter. If my daughter breaks the rules, I'm going to discipline her. But I'm not going to throw her out of the family. She's always going to be my daughter no matter what happens. Even if she began to doubt and said to me, Dad, you know, I'm not sure you're really even my dad. You know, God forbid. And I asked him, would that make her no longer be my daughter because she doubted that? No. Or what if even, God forbid, she even said, I hate you, you're not my dad anymore. Would that take the DNA out of her body and she's no longer my child? No. So the point is that just as the child will always be that parent's child, just like your son will always be your son, your daughter will always be your daughter, once God is your father, once you're a child of God, you will always be a child of God. But he will discipline you. He will chasten you. He will chastise you. But you know what he'll never do? He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. And the Bible says nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think those are the two most classic illustrations, that of the eternal gift, the gift of eternal life. And then you can also show them the verse that says in 1 John chapter 2, and this is the promise that he hath promised us even eternal life. Hey, is God going to break that promise? Now, once I give them one or both of those illustrations about the gift and about the child, then I go into an even clearer explanation because a lot of people need to hear this a few times or a few different ways before it clicks with them because they've been so ingrained, hey, if you do this, you're going to go to hell. You know, or if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. They've heard all this preaching about losing their salvation in false religions. So want to make sure they get it. So what I explain next is, well, what if you do something really bad, though? Just to really drive this in, I say, you know, what if I were to go out and do something really bad? If I were to commit a really big sin? And I say to them, if I go out and commit a really big sin, I'm going to get a really big punishment on this earth. You know, if I were to go out and kill someone, I'm going to go to prison, probably for the rest of my life. God could allow even worse things to happen to me. If I were to go out and commit adultery, 
You know, I could lose my job. I could lose my family. I could get a disease. You know, God could cause us to get in a car accident or whatever. So if I commit a big sin, I'm going to get a big punishment. If I commit a little sin, I'm going to get a little punishment. But that happens on this earth. When it comes to heaven and hell, it's based on whether or not we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. If we have believed on the name of the Son of God, you know, we are saved. It's done. We have eternal life. And no man is able to pluck us out of his hand. It's funny, I was out soul winning with Pastor Jimenez when I was 20 years old and he was 16 years old. So this is, you know, 16 years ago, we were out soul winning together in California and we knocked on this lady's door and Brother Jimenez was doing the talking and he showed her that verse, no man shall pluck them out of my hand. He was trying to preach eternal security unto her. And this is what she said. She said, well, you know, God will never let go of you, but you can let go of him. And I'd heard that so many times from Pentecostals. And, and so, you know, he's just countering it with scripture. And when I heard that same objection, I would just counter that with scripture and just show all the verses why you can't lose your salvation. But we walked away from the door and Brother Jimenez said to me, he said, you know, that doesn't even make sense because... If you let go, but God's still holding on, how are you going to get your hand out of his hand? You know what I mean? If you're holding him and he's holding you, and you let go, it's like, okay. You know, think about it. Like, come on up here. here. So, like, okay, he's holding my hand, I'm holding his hand. All right, go ahead and let go. Let go. No, you walk away from your salvation. Go ahead, walk away. Walk away. Walk away. Come on. Walk. I said walk away. Come on. Come on, you're a Nazarene. You can walk away from your salvation. Right? See, the bottom line is, if he's holding you in his hand and he's greater than all and no one is able to pluck you out of his hand, it doesn't matter whether you let go because you're not the one hanging on in the first place. He's the one that's hanging on to you. And just as I am stronger than this boy, you know, he's a lot stronger than we are. He's greater than all. So the point is, that when we explain eternal security, using illustrations and using a few Bible verses will drive this point in. Here are some great verses. If you want to note down some good verses to prove eternal security at the door, just for a simple proof of eternal security, I would say, obviously, Romans 6.23, because you can go into the, the eternal life as a gift illustration. John 1.12 about how we are the sons of God. And uh, you could also back that up with other verses on the fact that we are the sons of God. Another great verse is John 5.24. Flip over to it if you would. John 5.24. The verse that I quoted about no man being able to pluck us out of Christ's hand or the Father's hand is John 10.28. It says, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, spoken by Christ. And then in the next verse, he says, My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So we are in Christ's hand, and we're in the Father's hand. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> now, John 5, 24 is the verse that was shown unto me when I got saved as a little boy. My mother won me the Lord when I was just six years old, and this is the verse that she showed me, John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath, that's present tense, has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. I mean, look, if we have everlasting life, you can't lose it. It's everlasting. And we've already passed from death to life. And we shall not come into condemnation. Now, what sense would that make if he said, well, you're not going to come into condemnation because you're just not going to sin anymore? That's nonsense. Of, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But it's just that we're never going to come into condemnation. Why? Because we've been passed from death unto life. So we can use some of these verses, and there are many other verses you can use. I'm just giving you some of the best verses to prove this. Uh, obviously, Hebrews 13.5 says that he'll never leave us or forsake us. 
Romans chapter 8, where it says that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, you know, you could go to all different verses, but really any verse that says the word eternal life or everlasting life is a proof text for this doctrine. Because if he said, even in John 6, 47, if you want to keep it simple, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. He didn't say you had everlasting life as if you had lost it. You will get everlasting life in the future. He says you have everlasting life. And if I have everlasting life on April 20th, 2018, that means I'm going to have it on April 20th, 2019. And if not, it didn't last forever. It ended. You can't have to everlasting life temporarily. That's an oxymoron in and of itself. But here's what we want to stay away from when we are explaining eternal security. What we want to stay away from is these wild-eyed illustrations and extreme examples that make it sound crazy or unbelievable. So we want to stay away from this kind of thing. You know, what if you went out and just went on a killing spree and you're just you're shooting men, women, children, just murdering people and you're just raping and pillaging, you know. You sound like a lunatic. You sound like a crazy person. And you're like, well, but yeah, but if I did, I you know, it's like, come on. Don't get all crazy with your illustration. You know, and even if I bring up murder, what am I balancing that with? I'm balancing that with, hey, listen, murder is a huge sin. And if you commit murder, you're going to get a huge punishment on this earth. God will change. You're going to prison, you know. What we don't want to do is just make it sound like, yeah, I mean, you just kill people, commit adultery, you're still going to heaven. You believe it? You're making it sound crazy because you're not balancing that message. The way that you balance the teaching on eternal security is with the chastisement of God. Every single door where I give someone the gospel, every single door, you know what I always bring up at every single door? That if you sin, God's going to punish you on this earth, even if you're saved. And this helps people to understand. Because a lot of people, they misunderstand and think, well, you're just saying that you just live however you want. It doesn't matter if we go to church. It doesn't matter if we follow the commandments. It doesn't matter if we fornicate and commit adultery and murder and get drunk. Look, none of us in this room think that that stuff doesn't matter. We all think that that lifestyle that we live matters. So we don't want people to get that wrong impression. Now, it doesn't matter in regard to our salvation, but we want to make it clear what we mean. So the best way to explain this is to say, look, if you go out and do these horrible things, you're going to get punished. God's going to chastise you. And a great verse for this is in Hebrews chapter 12. Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. And listen, whenever I explain eternal security to anybody, I always balance that by explaining to them the chastisement of God. Because when you explain to them the chastisement of God, then it makes sense to people. If you just tell them, yep, you just murder, whatever, and you're going to heaven, people are not going to get that. And if you show them a verse that proves that, they're still going to be like, I don't know, that just doesn't sound right. <laughs> that there's just no consequence for our actions. Well, let me ask you this. Is there no consequence for our actions? There is certainly a consequence. So we don't want to mislead people that there's no consequence. So it's good to explain to them chastisement on this earth, chastisement in this life. And whenever I explain that to people, that's where I can see it click with people. That makes sense. Look, everything about the gospel makes sense. I mean, from the point about us all being sinners, deserving hell, Christ dying on the cross, the resurrection, faith alone... It all makes sense. Okay, so what you need to do is explain it in such a way where it makes sense. To where people get the message and comprehend what you're saying. So don't get crazy with the illustrations. You don't have to talk about just these mass murders and, and just serial killings and everything like that. I think people get the point. If you just explain to them... You know, hey, if you commit a big sin, and you can give an example of a big sin, you know, somebody robbing a bank, committing adultery, committing murder, but make sure that you acknowledge to that person, hey, that's a really big sin, that's really bad, 
And if someone does that, they're going to be chastised for that on this earth. But they would still go to heaven because they've believed on Christ and because of the fact that it's eternal, and you could, again, use the illustration of a father-son, a gift, etc. So that's the biggest thing I want to get across to you today on the subject of eternal security. Include it in your gospel presentation before the prayer. Now, when you're done explaining eternal security to the person, at the end, now my, my next talk that I'm going to give tonight at... Uh, 8.15 is going to be about the wrap-up or uh, leading them in prayer. But I'm going to go ahead and get into a little bit of that now with the remaining time that I have. And basically, what you want to do, once you've explained eternal security, which is the, the last point in the gospel presentation, what you want to do is make sure that they understood it. So I like to do a little wrap-up at the end just to make sure that everybody understands what I've explained to them. And the way I do that wrap-up is I just ask them a few questions. I say, now, let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for all your sins? Yes. Do you believe that he rose again from the dead and, you know, physically walked out of that grave and showed the disciples the whole sin? Yes, I do. Then what I say to them after that is, if Jesus were standing here right now and you asked him to save you, would he do it? Yes. And how long would you be saved for? Forever. And is there anything you could ever do to mess that up? No. And then I reiterate to them, you could do a lot of things to mess up your life on this earth, but could you ever mess that up? No, I could never mess that up. So just that quick little wrap-up demonstrates the fact that they understood. Yep, Jesus died for my sins. If I asked him to save me, he would do it because he saves those who believe. And that if I were saved, I would be saved forever and there's nothing I could ever do to lose my salvation. So that's just a quick little wrap up to make sure they understood. Now, if they understood that far, then I will say to them, let me just go ahead and pray with you before I go. Now, I don't ask people, so do you want to pray? Now, here's why I don't ask them if they want to pray. Because of the fact that I want them to pray with me to receive Christ as Savior. Now you say, well, you're just going around and just praying with people and they don't even want to. But hold on a second. I was thorough in my explanation of the gospel. And not only was I very thorough and made sure that they understood everything, I asked them questions and I am convinced at this point that this person believes the gospel and believes that salvation is by faith and that salvation is eternal. So if, they, if this person believes everything that they need to believe, then you know what? This person needs to pray and ask Christ to save them. Why would I say, do you want to? It's a no-brainer. Let's do it. Let's do it. Now, if this person is shaky on their understanding, I'm not going to pray with them. If I get the feeling that this person didn't get it, didn't understand what I was saying at any point, then I'm going to just walk away and call that a seed planted and say, hey, listen, you know, listen to this preaching CD later or, you know, watch this video after the tribulation or whatever. You know, hopefully they can learn more about the Bible and eventually the thing will click. But if I'm confident that they understood everything that I preached, that they believe everything right, why wouldn't I pray with that person? Let's pull them out of the fire. It didn't say stand next to the fire and say, come on. Come out of the fire. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. No, pull them out. So I'm for compelling them to come in. I'm for persuading them to be a Christian. I'm for a confrontational method. And I'm for just helping them to pull the trigger. Push them over the edge. Say, hey, let me just pray with you. This is what I do. I say to them, let me just pray with you before I go. And I want to help you tell God right now that that's what you believe. Because he's not standing here with us, but we know he hears us through prayer. So let's pray right now, and I tell them, you can just repeat after me, and I'm just going to help you tell this to God right now. Let's bow our heads and pray. And you know what? If people believed everything right up to this point, they will pray with you 99% of the time. Now, people who tell me, you know what? I give people the gospel, and everything goes great, and like, half the time or two-thirds of the time, they don't want to pray with me. 
There's something wrong with that picture. There's something, you know, maybe you're not explaining everything thoroughly up to that point. Maybe there's something missing in your gospel presentation where you're not being thorough, you're not making the gospel clear. Or maybe there's something weird about the way you're asking.